what am I doing with accepting this? All right, folks, it's a little after 12 o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everyone, to our um, third annual or third preservation conversation of 2022. My name is Joe Ritter. I'm the Program and Advocacy Manager here at Preservation Massachusetts, and I'm glad you all can join us today for our conversation, Storytelling in Preservation. Now, for those of you who are new with our program or are unfamiliar, Preservation Conversations is a virtual program that our staff started in 2020, the early days of the pandemic, and they're designed as a way to connect with our community and share practical resources to help them grow their historic preservation toolbox. And today I'm glad to be joined um, by three wonderful guest speakers. We have Meg Campbell and Lisa Ryan from the Preservation Trust of Vermont, and from Historic Boston Incorporated, we have Kathy Cotteridis. Thank you all for joining us um, today. And our speakers today are joining us to share some of their experiences about an important issue that impacts all of the work we do across the history field, storytelling, or as I like to call it, how to talk about history and historic preservation with people who aren't interested in historic preservation. Now, one of the things that we've tried to stress and emphasize this year across all of our programming is the importance of community and engaging with members of the community. And from what we've seen across the field is the most successful preservation and history initiatives are those that emphasize the importance of historical significance and community impact in equal measure. We all know that the resources that we work with and attempt to preserve are historically significant but the, challenges, the challenge we face is to express why they should continue to matter today and tomorrow. Now, as many of us know, talking to the public about history and historic preservation can be an intense labor of love. And for a lot of us, that's the reason why we got into this field, right? We enjoy communicating with members of the public about our field. But we also know that it can be extremely difficult something we have to practice, and it can be hard to know where to start. Um, this is an issue that continually comes up when we meet with our state partners across the field, and it's become a major theme of our Cruising the Commonwealth listening sessions that we've been holding over the summer. So we know it's something that we wanted to address in one of these virtual programs. Now put simply, to be an effective historic preservationist is to also be an effective storyteller. Whether you are currently working on a preservation project with your town, or if you're writing interpretive signage at a museum or leading tours at a historic site, knowing how to talk about your project and your topic will help you grow awareness in your community and achieve positive outcomes for your history project. Now, of course, the challenge as we know it is historic History and historic preservation can often seem extremely unapproachable to members of the public. For example, we as professionals are often guilty of using overcomplicated language or confusing jargon when talking about our projects. Who amongst us, for example, haven't gotten a little glazy eyed after staring at National Register inventory forms all day? I know I have. Um, our field is one that is both regulatory and creative. So striking the important Right, striking the right balance with members of our community is so important. Preservation also comes with a number of stigmas attached about the type of work we do and the type of stories that we are interested in telling. So it's important to know how to engage with multiple audiences about preservation issues 
in order to change the public's perception about the work we do in their community. But telling compelling stories is more than just choosing the right words or the flashiest words. It means understanding the needs of the community and telling stories that matter to them. And in many cases, storytelling means preservationists and local advocates end up doing more listening than they do talking. But perhaps most importantly, the continued emphasis on storytelling and community engagement gets us a little closer to what historic preservation has always been about, which is local advocates and organizations banding together to advocate for a greater appreciation and understanding of our historical, cultural, and environmental resources. So without further ado, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce today's guest speakers. We're going to share some examples from their own work about how they have told interesting and compelling stories, made connections, and empowered their communities through preservation and storytelling. Now, first up, we have Meg and Lisa from the Preservation Trust of Vermont, and then they will be followed by Kathy Cotteridis. Um, each will have about 10 to 15 minutes to go through their program. Now, as we move through their presentations, if anybody from the audience has questions for our guest speakers, I would encourage you to put your questions in the chat box. And at the end of all of the presentations, we'll have time to go through some of those questions live on the air. So without further ado, I'll shut up. And Megan, Lisa, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. I'm Lisa Ryan from the Preservation Trust of Vermont. Uh, my colleague Meg Campbell is also on the call. Um, and Meg and I are going to just talk a little bit about um, kind of how to develop how to develop a story and also how, as, as Joe put it, how to um, really um, use language that is going to be accessible to people who are not um, academic preservationists, but just kind of talking with the general public and, and kind of figuring out what your story is. Um, so I work for the Preservation Trust of Vermont as both a field service representative and I also um, manage our federal grant uh, that we have right now through the through the National Park Service, and I work on some foundation grants. And you know, in my experience um, working with projects, what I found is that oftentimes um, communities need to get community support for these projects because they're not always all funded by grants. They do oftentimes have other resources in them, and when um, these big projects come. Uh, these opportunities, I would call them, come to a town, oftentimes you'll find, and I'm sure all of you have experienced this, <clears throat> there will be people who will say, well, we can't do that. It's too expensive. And we can't do that. Oh, that's already been, we've already tried that. Oh, that old building. Why is that an important building? We need to focus on paving our roads. And, you know, you'll hear all kinds of stuff coming up from the community about, about the building itself, about why it might not be possible. And then you'll hear other stories too about, well, that building's, you know, that's where I went to prom every year. My mom and dad got married there. And so you kind of like start to glean this information from the community, both negative and positive. And so what we've really found in our work is that helping communities to, to shape and talk about their own story is really important because we as preservationists can go in and say, oh, this is significant. This is relevant. This is important. We can talk about the architect. We can talk about the architecture. And to an average person, that's not really going to resonate. So um, what we found is that communities engaging in that community outreach is the way you start to develop the real story behind your buildings. And I can give you a few examples. Um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen. And I'll make it big. I think all of you could probably see this. This is um, in the background, you'll see the Coventry Village Church. Um, this is a, a, a very large uh, building built in 1803. It's one of the oldest churches in Vermont. It is 
just a, an incredible resource in the town of Coventry, which is way up in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, this building has not been used for nine years. And prior to that, it was used as a church with a very, very tiny congregation. Um, the building has uh, an extraordinary amount of deferred maintenance. Um, and the congregation decided that they were no, they could no longer care for the building and they wanted to donate the building to the town. And of course, when, when people in town hear that, it raises a lot of concerns for people. Oh, how are we gonna pay for this? How are we gonna maintain it? Well, what are we gonna do with it? So this town um, really went through an amazing community engagement process around this building. So this picture was taken uh, in the summer back in 20, I think it was 2019. Um, what the town did was they organized a community day around gathering information around this building. So inside the church, I don't have pictures of this, but inside the church, they had set up stations all around the, the sanctuary with big um, flip charts. And on the flip charts, <clears throat> they asked questions about what people would like to see happen in that building, what people felt was missing in their community, um, how people envisioned their community or that space, you know, five years down the line, 10 years down the line. And they actually invited people in. And while they were doing this up on the, on the, in the front of the church, up on the altar, they had um, musicians, a whole slew of different musicians coming in. They had a quartet, they had a piano player, they had a cello, um, a cellist come in. And so throughout this afternoon of gathering this information, they also activated the space by bringing in people who, um, kind of showed like, hey, what do you think about this for a music venue by, by actually having people in that space? And it drew over the course of that afternoon, about 150 people came out. Um, outside of the building, as you can see, they had a cookout. They had hamburgers and hot dogs, people brought potato salads. And they also encouraged people when they were sitting down, they had folks, volunteers going around and handing out note cards and saying, hey, can you share with us what your vision would be for this space and for this um, facility? And from that, um, that effort, they were able to really build a tremendous amount of community support for this project because it allowed people <clears throat> to participate. It allowed, and it also allowed people, <coughs> excuse me, to visualize how this space could be used. I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen for a moment. Um, another example of that is there's another town that we have been uh, involved with, uh, the town of Callis. See if we have anything on our website about this. They had a town hall. <clears throat> that was underutilized. And that town hall um, is probably one of the most photographed buildings um, in the town of Callis. It's very iconic, white steepled church um, that was then converted to um, a town hall. And it suffered also, as many places do, from a tremendous amount of deferred maintenance. And when the town did their analysis to figure out what it was going to cost, it came in around $2 million. <clears throat> and of course, in a small rural town, that price tag raised a tremendous amount of red flags for people. And it took the town going through a very significant um, process of community engagement to gain support for this project. Um, 
So I'm gonna just share my screen one more time, show you this building. This is the Callis Town Hall. Um, you know, when, when the group started to have meetings with the community, a lot of the sentiment was, just fix the exterior and make it something that people can come and take pictures of. Basically abandon the building. But through this town, this is a very rural town, so Callis is known as having the most dirt roads in, in one town in all of the state. And Callis also is very unique because it has little villages within the, within the town. So this uh, building is located in what's called Gospel Hollow. There's a little part of town called Adamant. There's a part of town called Maple Corner. Uh, there's East Callis, there's North Callis. So like these, none of these places are more than five miles apart. So you have to understand this is like a very small community of 1700 people, but each little neighborhood kind of has its own personality. So to gain support for doing this project in this neighborhood, this group uh, did some amazing community outreach. They actually went to the local grocery store and got one of those sheet cakes that you find in the local grocery store and had an image of the town hall airbrushed onto the sheet cake. Now, because they have seven little village centers within their town, they did this seven times. And they actually brought this project from little village community to little village community. So sometimes there were 25 people at these meetings, sometimes there were 40 people at these meetings, but they really didn't say, okay, you come to us and tell us what you want. They actually went to their, their community and their constituents and what they did was they explained, here's, here's this project, here's what needs to be done, here's how we came up with the budget. Now tell us, what do you wanna see happen here? How do you envision this space being used? If we can address these issues, how could this fill a, a, a gap in the services that the town already offers? Or how could this building be repurposed so that it can be a more flexible space for the community? And this, this was just such, what I thought was just such a brilliant approach um, because what they were able to do is they were actually able to identify new partners to help them program that building. Um, they, there was a, a theater group that was located in a part, Maple Corner, one of the communities that had just recently found out that the barn that they were holding their summer theater program in was no longer um, an option for them because of fire safety. And so through shopping this around, they started having these conversations with this theater group. And the theater group and the committee that was working on this project was, were able to work together to design a project that allowed the upper story of that building to be used as their primary home for their theater group. Um, so it was really, um, again, an opportunity for this community to create a new story around a building that most people had kind of thought, well, it's, it, it's, it served its purpose. It's no longer useful for that anymore. So we should just move on. Um, so in this way, this community engagement piece in our experience has really been the foundation of good storytelling. It's really going out and finding out from your community what it is that they uh, want to see happen here and also the stories behind what has happened there. What's the emotional connection that people have to these spaces? Um, so I'm gonna leave it there and kind of turn it over to Meg to talk a little bit more about what we do with that information once we get it. Hi, everybody. Um, so I, uh, Lisa works in the field at the Preservation Trust and I do communications for our organization. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the kinds of, um, of actual changes that we've made and how we tell our story Tell the story. Tell the story of the Preservation Trust and the work we do over time, and the story of what we do is really the story of what communities do, and our support follows that. So I'm going to share my screen. I just have a really brief presentation, then you get to watch a movie. Um, let's see here. Okay, can you see? Okay. So um, one of the things that we've spent a lot of time thinking about is the use of images and how we tell stories. Like 
this is a white church with the steeple. There are a lot of these in Vermont. There are a lot of these all throughout New England. And this, yes, this does tell a particular story, but is this story particularly compelling for people um, who, who, who see it or read it? Not if there's a hundred kajillion of them and you've been showing them for, you know, the last 40 years. But this, which is the same building, has two children in it, tells a totally different story. In this case, we worked with the community to help. Um, it was, it's a rural community in the northeastern part of Vermont, and we helped them um, locate a child care center in the basement of the building. So um, kind of thinking about how you use images to tell the story and the whole story makes a huge difference in how, how the how people receive information about the importance of that building. You know, in Vermont, child care is a huge issue and knowing that the projects we support are supporting increasing child care just totally changes the relevance of this beautiful um, steeple church. Um, Another change we've made has to do with the kind of language we use around describing the work that we do. This is something um, I pulled off of our website from um, about 15 years ago. This is how we used to talk about um, the projects we supported. In Addiston, we did this. In Reedsboro, we did this. Statewide, we did this. And this is what we would send out to our donors um, at the end of the year. This is what we send out now. So we combine pictures and text and um, the, like I said before, having people in these images is hugely important. And the first line of this is not, the left bank was built in 1895 by, you know, Trevor McCullough. That's not what it is. The first line of this is for Christine Graham, it took a lot of nerve to ask Merchants Bank to donate their historic building in North Bennington to a nonprofit organization for community use. But in 2013, as a board member of the Fund for North Bennington, she did and they said yes. That's a totally different kind of story that can really resonate with people because it's about people. It's about people, you know, being bold and saving these places that really matter to them. So um, then our support comes in at the very end. We're leading with the community groups and we're leading with the people and we're leading with the action that they've done that is meaningful. And we follow by supporting them. So then down here we have this stuff about the 1772 Foundation. Um, so uh, just a couple other things that you can do um, in addition to um, uh, just in general images and texts. Um, you can these days create all kinds of mini stories and we did a series on preservation champions um, and the story is actually longer than this but this is all I could fit on the screen um, where we would highlight individuals who are doing good work and tell their story and how they've kind of pulled the community together to get a project off the ground and what this place is going to be used for and kind of generate some local excitement. Um, and then once you have these little mini stories, you can share them in places like on your newsletter, in your website, or in social media, if you're into social media. Um, you can also, once you build up a cadre of these stories, you can share them at board meetings or at donor visits um, so that how you talk about these projects is not just, oh, we're working on this 1895 building in Ferrisburg. It's the community of Ferrisburg is so excited to um, get together and have a place in their town that means something to them where they can do things. So it and, and donors can relate to that because it's about people. You know, it's not just about the building. Yeah, you can tailor it if you have somebody who's particularly interested in architectural history, you can tailor it. But it really is about sort of the vitality of the communities. So um, uh, we also have started doing an annual report um, that uh, is just chock full of stories. And we're working with a prof professional photographer who takes the pictures, girl. which makes it a huge difference in um, in how these stories are shared. And um, <clears throat> we started doing this um, actually during the pandemic. We had set out versions of annual reports, but nothing quite like this. And we did it um, 
the year after our founding director um, died and the pandemic had started. And um, in the fall, we had normally done a silent auction, um, which had usually brought in somewhere around um, 15 to $20,000 um, as a fundraising event. We couldn't do it because of the pandemic. And so my energies were directed into doing this. And it was not a direct appeal, but it included an envelope in it. Um, if people wanted to make a donation. When we sent out the annual report, within three weeks, we had made well more than we would have made had we done the silent auction, um, just because people read the stories and they felt compelled to donate and support us. So that's pretty exciting. So um, the other thing that we do, um, and this is really the main way that we help tell stories, um, of projects in Vermont is through our preservation awards. And I know Preservation Massachusetts now also does this. Um, and we give them out every other year, anywhere between five and 10 awards a year. And I've created videos. So what I'd like to do is to show you one of the videos that sort of combines both elements of the community type um, story gathering that Lisa was talking about, but also shows how we take that information and shape it and present it to um, a greater crowd. And we show these at our annual conference. Um, and this year we showed five videos to about 350 people, I think, at the conference. Wow. So um, here we go. You ready? <laughs> Is it possible to transform an entire downtown block in the span of a weekend, bringing new life to a historic Main Street and sparking long-term change? In Bethel, Vermont, it is. Like many small towns, Bethel's once thriving downtown fell victim to empty storefronts, peeling paint, and crumbling facades. The relatively intact stretch of seven large historic buildings were vacant, underutilized, for sale, or in need of major repairs. Bethel's community spirit was flagging. With no municipal support or funding for economic development, it took Tropical Storm Irene and a burst of incremental grassroots projects to turn the tide. The volunteer group Bethel Revitalization Initiative created a downtown pocket park, started community conversations about the future of downtown, and created the free pop-up Bethel University. With the support of AARP Vermont and Team Better Block, the BRI built on a new energy and interest in town to host Vermont's first Better Block demonstration. More than 60 volunteers came together in October 2016 to transform the downtown back into a vibrant Main Street. They created temporary pop-up businesses in the vacant historic buildings. They created a beer garden in a parking lot. They created a temporary bike lane and safer pedestrian crossings to slow traffic and make the downtown more enjoyable. And they gathered input on what changes people want to see permanently. In the 18 months since the demonstration, the historic Blossom Block has sold and is being restored. The new owner has hosted four seasonal pop-up markets creating sales opportunities for local artisans and the first storefront reopened this winter. Two local couples who are active Better Block leaders purchased the historic Arnold Block and are reviving it as a community incubator space that directly meets the needs identified through Better Block. Two doors down, a young couple purchased the Depot train station and will reopen this spring as a music venue and bar. They chose Bethel because of the creative energy downtown and used better block outcomes to write a business plan. Bethel won a $15,000 animating infrastructure grant for three downtown art projects and is about to launch a long-term pilot of pedestrian ball bouts. 
In just 18 months, Bethel has shown how a quick, creative demonstration project can lead to rapid reinvestment and revitalization. And it's quickly becoming a statewide model with towns across Vermont looking to this lighter, quicker, cheaper, and fun approach. The community spirit of Bethel is now thriving. I, I just want to jump in to say that, you know, the, um, to see that downtown go from having so many vacant buildings. I mean, the, the Babes Bar um, that opened in the old train depot was something that they had talked about for probably 20 years. And it's now open and it is, it's, thriving. And as Meg in the video talked about the Arnold block, they have co-working space. They have young people now living in apartments um, in downtown uh, Bethel. I mean, it's really been kind of amazing to see how they've been able to reinvigorate their downtown. And I really believe that it's because they did such a high level of community engagement and really found out from people how they wanted to see those buildings used. Um, I wanna share one more thing and that is, I'm gonna just quickly share my screen so I can show it to you. Um, the, I, I wanna recommend a, um, a mini, uh, a little um, video clip from a workshop that was done um, as part of the Vermont Story Lab, which is an organization that I helped found um, for nonprofits of all kind to do a better job storytelling. And this was at one of our events. And the woman doing this is Rebecca Sanborn Stone, who is also behind this work that happened in Bethel. And she does an absolutely fantastic presentation on um, stories to values to action. And I highly recommend that everybody um, watch it. It's too long to show here, it's 20 minutes long. So I'm gonna just type the link here in the, um, in the chat. So copy it and then go watch it at another time, but it's really, really good. It'll make you do your PowerPoints totally differently. <laughs> so, all right, that's all I have for right now. Um, I guess Kathy, you're up next, right? Great. Thank you so much, Lisa and Meg. That was that was a great presentation, and we'll include some links um, to your website um, in the chat. I encourage you all to take a look at some of their videos. So, yes, um, Kathy, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. What happened to my PowerPoint? Hold on a moment. There you are. Share and Go to slideshow from the beginning. All right, can you see that? All good, and you can hear me, all right, great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kathy Cotteridis, and on behalf of Historic Boston Incorporated, I wanna thank you for having us here today to tell you about our organization and to ask your support for our bid to be designated developer of the historic Upham's Corner Comfort Station in Dorchester. Historic Boston Inc. is a nonprofit organization that redevelops at-risk historic buildings in order to help Boston's neighborhoods thrive. We were formed 62 years ago to face down the threat of demolition to downtown Boston's oldest historic building the old corner bookstore, I'm sorry, the oldest commercial building, um, the old corner bookstore, a property that was built in 1718 and had witnessed the events of the American Revolution on the streets of Boston and in the 19th century was home to Tickner and Fields, the innovative publisher of Thoreau, Hawthorne, Longfellow, and the Atlantic Monthly. The old corner, which by 1960, needed considerable investment was to be demolished for a parking garage. 
a group of civic minded people gathered together their friends and their political capital and their money and formed the nonprofit Historic Boston Inc. that would purchase this building and restore it, putting it back into use for what it had always been a commercial building with retail businesses and offices. The parking lot, lot next door was eventually built um, and Historic Boston uh, still owns the old corner bookstore and has its offices there. Uh, its first generation of restoration took place in the early 60s, but ultimately the entire building was put back into use for new commercial spaces. It's now what is considered 100% corner in retail jargon. In other words, it's a highly desirable place to do business, a far cry from the state of affairs in the 1960s Boston. But perhaps the best story is the quietest one, and that is that the revenue that Historic Boston derives from all of those commercial leases at the old corner bookstore underwrites the broader work of the nonprofit organization in carrying out important rehabilitation work throughout the city's neighborhoods. The model of the old corner bookstore was taken citywide beginning in the 1970s, and that has ultimately led to considerable redevelopment of endangered buildings throughout the city. As a patient developer uh, or investor really, Historic Boston has worked on 67 historic buildings and invested more than $28 million uh, throughout the city's neighborhoods. And in each case, redeveloping uh, buildings for mostly new uses. HBI's projects preserve local history and architecture, but they also create jobs, build new enterprise, reach into communities that who, where preservation is the best real estate development um, that the, the neighborhood can support, and also helps communities see possibility in existing assets within their communities. We would like to bring this type of development work to the Dorchester North uh, the Upham's Corner Comfort Station in Dorchester. HBI is here to ask that we be designated by the City of Boston to rehabilitate the Comfort Station for reuse as a full service cafe and a restaurant by our partner, Comfort Kitchen. Our proposal brings together the right preservation trades and, and capital to redevelop this building for a restaurant, which will bring healthy and locally sourced food to, to a sit down environment, a, a restaurant in the evening and a cafe during the day, locally owned by two, um, or by, I'm sorry, by three individuals from the community. It supports job skill development and wealth creation for residents through food service and employment ownership. And it also restore, restores and preserves the history of a long neglected building and a place that this neighborhood values for its association with the transportation history of the city and the center of Dorchester's commercial activity. Surrounded by the Dorchester North Burying Ground, the, um, the Uplands Corner Comfort Station um, sits in one of the best assemblies of 19th century commercial architecture in the neighborhoods of the city. It was built in 1912 by the city of Boston, a tiny 1200 square foot structure that was to serve as public bathrooms. And they were to serve the commuters traveling across the region's complex streetcar network radiating from the crossroads of Columbia Road and Dudley Street. But while the streetcar disappeared in the 1950s, the comfort station survives and reminds us of an era when public infrastructure and transportation was important to the city. Of course, the condition of the building has not um, fared very well. However, with the excep exception of uh, a small moment in 1979, um, of a small moment of fame, shall we say, uh, the Upham's Corner Comfort Station has done nothing really but deteriorate behind chain link fence, a victim of vandalism and exposure to the elements for nearly 50 years. But the opportunity 
is what we're here to discuss today. The opportunity to turn around this building um, and, and its unique architecture and its unique history and redeploy all of that as a full service restaurant for Comfort Kitchen, a restaurant owned by three experienced restaurant professionals of color who all live in Dorchester and who are committed to presenting the cuisine of the African and Asian diaspora. We project a $1 million, a $1.2 million rehabilitation of the building. Sorry, <laughs> keeping up my slides. Um, and uh, that will take 18 months from the start of construction to complete. Um, HBI and Comfort Kitchen agree that after the development is complete, HBI will transfer the ownership of this building to the owners of Comfort Kitchen so, and retain a, a permanent preservation restriction on the building uh, for HBI. But ultimately, the ownership will be turned over to these three individuals who will be starting and operating the 35-seat restaurant. Bipla Rai, Niako Perry Pearl, and Kwasi Kwa have raised $750,000 in working capital from grassroots sources in order to fit out this restaurant and make the project work. They plan to employ 11 people and expect to transfer for the property, I'm sorry, the restaurant into an employee owned company um, eventually in order to support equity growth for individuals um, that are in fact working there. We believe that a preservation-based redevelopment of the property with an active end user that is connected to the community is the best solution for this property and for the future of the, the neighborhood. Our team's depth of experience in development and restaurant operations positions it to be a success. Thank you. Now, I purposefully decided to do some storytelling through a pitch today. Um, this is not an unusual place for historic Boston to be, and, and that is pitching our services for an abandoned or endangered building within the city. In this case, um, we were successful, and as you can see, this is the latest stage of the re restoration of this building. Um, and it's uh, planning on, on being completed by October and, and will come online as a restaurant at that time. But I wanted to uh, offer you some perspective on Historic Boston and how it talks about itself um, when it's presenting or pitching for anything, whether it's money or um, a project, and also how that translates um, into the projects that we talk about. Um, and how we present them to communities, what's at stake, their history, their meaning, um, and the public benefits that ultimately come from a redevelopment path um, that we're proposing. In this particular case, we were up against um, two other private bidders who did not have a preservation orientation, but definitely had um, an economic proposal. We feel that we were attempting um, to present not just um, the opportunity for small business, but an opportunity to make improvements that enhance the neighborhood and enhance an individual building from a preservation standpoint. Um, in all of our communications, whether it's presentations, proposals, events, ribbon cuttings, social media, we aim to illustrate why Historic Boston's work matters and how our approach, our work, our outputs will be different um, from others um, for the community that we're working in. In, in this case, um, telling the organization's story first often frames, um, gives us credibility um, and, and gives us, it presents our experience so that we can um, appear to know what we're talking about when it comes to the, the project itself. But a few other things to note that we have really come to believe are very important in in talking about individual properties, but also in thinking about the, the way in which we communicate and the strategy around it. Um, you know, we all know, and I think all of us uh, know from working in, in history and, and preservation that telling a story, illustrating it, ideally with historic photographs, if you have them, um, is something that um, will get people excited about the possibilities. Um, and 
telling them things that they did not know um, about a property, both in terms of information, but also a, a, a visual presentation of something, in this case, a very degraded building. It's hard to see the future. And no matter, um, for those of us in preservation who believe that others understand what a building could look like if restored, don't assume that. It's important to, to illustrate it. But being um, in the history business, setting context is really, really important in setting perspective. But there's multiple ways in which um, that has to happen. You can tell a very traditional, straightforward narrative and a story, but I can't really underscore um, more the need to be distinguishing between um, our documentary photographs and the things that are meant to just illustrate a building um, and the photographs that show a property in use or uh, photographs that will um, uh, give folks a sense of, of what a place might be used like. Um, but also while we're in the business of, of history, historic preservation uh, the, and, and many elements of the past, we're also very much, I mean, I can say this for historic Boston, but I would argue all of us are in the business of making um, improvements um, and, and also in the real estate business and also in the community building business. So we are also really primed for telling stories that also support neighborhood improvement and building alliances um, that have broader community um, benefits um, that than just simply um, the improvement of a place uh, for either its historic value or um, just its real estate uh, value, quite literally financial value. Um, so however intoxicating historic photos and narratives can be, the concept of setting context also needs to include and be thoughtful of the wider relationships that we have in the community. Um, for us to embark even on talking about a proposal the way that we are here um, really required us to, to make many, many um, uh, phone calls, but also individual meetings with direct abutters, with community-based organizations around this particular property and within this neighborhood. It's a lot of listening and it's a lot of understanding what the interests and priorities are of neighbors. It helps to inform an excellent project. In this case, in Upham's Corner, we heard very clearly the need for meeting space and not formal meeting space, but casual, informal, um, crossroads kind of meeting um, space, but also a place, you know, the laundry list, right? The, a place for good coffee, a place for healthy food, um, and also um, a place, it, and if there is a business here that it should be owned by a local individual, somebody who's, who's hiring locally, bringing um, local values to a place. So all of these things are information that informed this presentation. Um, and, and yet it's even more, I would argue, when we're talking about context, it's also doing a lot more research on what the, um, perhaps what your opponents are thinking, um, what competitors may be thinking. Um, and, and some might also be understanding what the other priorities may be that aren't being necessarily articulated for this place. I can tell you that in many instances we're we're often up against the affordable housing community that um, thinks that the history is very nice, but the demand for affordable housing and housing units in general is far more um, pressing. Um, so really, if we lose this building, isn't it important that we um, focus on, on uh, density and other, um, uh, other types of, of housing initiatives? So it's important to hear that and important to understand that and in order to, to really be able to, um, to counter the, the things that compete with, with your vision as well. Um, but by looking at sort of undertaking a holistic analysis, um, you know, you really have much more of a sense of the possibility um, and, and the collaborations that might be generated in order to, um, to and in even some innovative ideas that may generate um, or may come from the 
uh, conversations had either with the butters and community members or even more widely speaking, other city planners, other regional planners, um, so that uh, you have some perspective on that. And it makes your community benefits um, that much more um, impactful. Um, I will stop there uh, and take questions uh, or engage in conversation with the other presenters. Thank you so much, Kathy, and thank you all to our to our guest speakers as well. Um, two unique perspectives on storytelling, talking about preservation, and engaging with your community. I think you know one of the big takeaways from all three of you is understanding your community, their needs, and then tailoring your conversation and your interpretation to their needs. Whether it's the Joe Schmoes on the street, no pun intended, or to developers or potential buyers, knowing how to talk to, to all of them and engage with them and make it interesting um, is part of the, of the work we do on a daily basis. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, as I mentioned, we've got, we've got a few minutes here um, for some questions. I'd like to start us off with one that I'm kind of curious about. So as, I, as I'm rattling off, feel free to include your questions in the chat. Um, but to all three presenters, um, as you know, a number of the people that we deal with um, are, are people who are just members of the community or concerned citizens, we might call them, who see a building in their community that's in danger of um, being torn down or being demolished. Um, and they're interested in spreading word about this, this building or this resource, but they don't have the, avail the access to the same resources that we might as statewide or local advocacy organizations. So my question to the three of you is, what um, advice would you give this person about how to engage with their community and talk about um, um, their historic resource and make that known. So whoever would like to start, you feel free to jump in. And let me know what you think. I mean, I, you know, in our work, what I often talk to people about is that there, are, I mean, most communities have events that, um, exist already that bring people together. So I know like when Rebecca was doing the better better block, um, the, the way that's before they even did better block, the way that started is that there was an existing community event and they just, this little group decided to put up a, again, a flip chart um, at an existing community event and just pose the question of like, tell us what, what is, what's missing in downtown Bethel. Like, what does the community need? What do people want to see happen? Um, and that sort of spurred the conversation and they got a lot of different responses, um, but there were some themes that kept coming up and that sort of gave the group um, the foundation to start the more, um, the bigger conversations. They also at that event asked people to put their name and email address down if they wanted to be, um, if they wanted the, the uh, Bethel revitalization group to keep in touch with them about what was going on, you know, and that's really kind of what they, how they started. They just gathered that information, sat down and looked at it and they did it through an existing, an existing event. So I guess to that, that's speaking to the fact that, you know, doesn't, you don't have to have a ton of money. You don't have to get a grant to do this. You don't, you know, it's just start with what you've already got. Um, uh, I don't, you know, in some, some places you may have town meeting. I know we have that in Vermont. So sometimes these small volunteer groups will set up a table at a town meeting just to take, to get people to share information with them. And I think, again, the, the key to a lot of this is like listening making sure that you're doing deep listening when people are talking to you. I think our inclination is oftentimes to try to like sell our project to say like why we think it's important and why it should happen. I think it's fine to offer information. I think it's really great to when people start to talk to you about the projects or their fears, concerns, objections, just keep saying, tell me more. Tell me more about that. Tell me more about that. Um, because then you're really going to kind of learn from the community, like, what's it going to take to get this done? What's it going to take to make this happen? Um, so yeah, start with what you've already got. Low hanging fruit. I guess I would only add to that, that 
you should be ready to hear all of that just to underscore the listening part because it may not be what either you or your group has as a preconceived notion. It might in fact contradict that and yet might not be um, impossible to reconcile, but don't, don't be, um, all right, be sincere about the, the ask that you're making, I think is probably the right way to put it. Um, but also be prepared to give that information back. Um, and so it's not just, um, you know, what you're hearing may engage others in your quest as well, not just get support generally, but in the group that's trying to advance it. Yeah, and, and it's okay, you know, Kathy said, you, you probably will hear things that you didn't expect. And I think our inclination as professionals in this field is often to try to respond with information, but while, you know, we could do this, there's grants for that. Sometimes it's best just to say, wow, I hadn't really thought about it that way. Or you're bringing things up that I'm hearing from other people too. This is really useful information. In those moments, you don't have to respond um, with a solution. You can just say, thank you. This is really important information. We really appreciate it. And a lot of times that's what people want is to be heard and for their voice to be included. Absolutely. That's, that's great information. And I love your point too about, you know, using what you have, because even if it seems like not enough, you know, compared to some bigger projects that you see out there, it's a start and it's a good way to, you know, make an entree to your community and attempt to bridge that conversation, bridge that gap and get positive outcomes started. Um, let's see. I think uh, to keep, to keep a, uh, look at the time. I think we'll have time for one more question if people want to stick with us a little longer. If you need to jump, you won't hurt my feelings. Um, but we'll do one more question here. And we've got a good one here from the audience. Um, and it's, it's about difficult storytelling. So have the stories told by the Preservation Trust of Vermont um, and Historic Boston Incorporated ever acknowledged um, distressing aspects of the history of the resources, such as deforestation, flooding, or second home gentrification or segregation, redlining. So if so, have potential donors um, resisted including such aspects in the history you tell? What do you guys think? I can talk just ever so briefly and then I think I need to hand it over to Kathy because you guys probably have much more difficult issues to talk about. But you know, our, our mission is to build community through saving historic resources and we, we want to offer solutions. And so that's what we tend to communicate about are the solutions and to help inspire other people. We do acknowledge, I mean, we have done two award films having to do with flooding, um, but also followed up with a solution. We just did another award film on the Lost Mural Project, um, which is about, um, you know, begins with the, um, immigrants from Lithuania and, you know, the perils that they faced. So um, we're, we're very focused on in inspiration and solutions. And um, I don't think we've ever just kind of laid out a problem and not helped people kind of guide them through it. So to answer your question, is it local boosterism? I mean, I guess in a way it is, but that's what that's what we're here for is to help communities save the places. And we do that through inspiration and giving them resources and ideas. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that one's a tough one and it gets tougher and tougher all the time, partly from a just a our own conscience standpoint, but also um, the changing dynamics, um, particularly in the urban environment. Um, I think the, the one that we've always leaned on or the theme that we've leaned on quite a bit um, and talked about at length in, in most of our, our past projects has been disinvestment. And uh, the, um, you know, the years, and you can see it in the Upham's Corner Comfort Station, the, the years where the public sector basically ignored um, a, an asset of theirs and, and let it effectively fall into ruin. Um, and that I think is a, a theme that has always cut across most of our projects. But 
the the one that I think that that we try very hard to work with, or the the approach that we typically try to work with on most of our projects is not just in telling the long past story, but trying to bring the whole story right up to the the present of a particular property. Um, that may have within it some tough um, some tough stories, but I think what we discovered a, a while ago is that communities today are very different and and frequently much more diverse. And therefore, they they're looking for their own experience somewhere in this continuum, um, and it's very difficult to be talking about um, some wealthy white landholder, um, but without making reference to the more recent history of black ownership um, in a property or another different um, type of, of um, uh, ownership on uh, or experience or event that may have taken place in the property in more recent history. And some of that is not waiting for what's significant 50 years and all of that. It's, it's thinking about um, what's been happening in that property, how it's factored into more recent um, history in the neighborhood. But I will say that the, one of the recent projects that we did was um, a farm, a present day urban farm, but a historic um, uh, farmstead uh, from the uh, early 19th century. Um, and we did spend the time, This we acquired it in 2015 and, and spent the time uh, as much as we could research or could discover, I guess, whether or not um, this had been a, um, a property that um, had been part of an even larger um, farm property in the 17th and 18th centuries and the house on it was built in the 1780s. So our, our goal was to figure out whether or not there was any semblance of slavery to any of the previous um, farm owners um, and thankfully could not discover any confirmation one way or the or that would suggest that, but it was important for us to, to know whether or not this any of these sites, particularly because the location in which the farm property that we were working on is 85% people of color, it was going to be really critical that we um, not be um, talking about something in a, in a nostalgic fashion when in fact um, it might be easily understood not to have been. So those, it's important to, to pause and to think about how you're framing the story that you're trying to tell and the importance that you're trying to tell and to whom you are saying this. Um, and you know, who are the, the folks and what would make them interested in and in why you would want to preserve a historic building. And again, not just for the use and, and the things that will ultimately lead to the building's renewal, but um, the, the underlying question or answer to the question, why is, is this place um, important and why should I care? Yeah, absolutely. All good points. And especially again, like we've, we've said it a couple of times, I think in this presentation, but knowing your audience and understanding what is important to them, including the current uses of the resource and its history and community history is so vital before we can even begin to start crafting a narrative or crafting an interpretation of this site. And that's a lot of the work that we have to do on the face of it. Um, so I, I appreciate all of your guys' takes on this and um, being cognizant of, of everybody's time. It's 105, so we'll, we'll start to wrap it up here. If you uh, have more questions for our guest speakers in the next couple of days, feel free to send that to our staff um, and we will pass along to our speakers to get an answer to you. This recording will be available on our website and on our YouTube channel um, for further viewing. Um, so thank you all for, uh, for lending us an hour of your time to listen in and check back with our, us on our website and social media for new upcoming preservation conversations in the next several months. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a nice afternoon.